Well, Bill, you've been involved with the CYC for well over 60 years. How did that all come about for you? Yeah, uh, 65 at least, 67. Uh, at the beginning, uh, at a very young age, 22, I owned and sailed my own boat. So I started fairly early. Uh, we had our boat at Bush's Boat Shed, which is just alongside almost. And uh, uh, CYC had not yet bought here at the time, or they had just bought at the time. And of course CYC members were the, as far as we were concerned, the top sailors in Sydney. And uh, we used to go along to the pub at Double Bay after races and of course get out at six o'clock, at six o'clock closing. Uh, and eventually we had to come to the CYC and we did, we came to the CYC. George Curtis and I owned the boat and uh, we joined here. So at about the age of 22, I joined the CYC. Uh, I was uh, a chartered accountant at the time, had just started my own practice. I did everything early in life. Uh, that's why I'm uh, having lived a bit, a number of years. I've seen a lot of things in the last uh, 70 years. Uh, anyhow, uh, soon after joining, I attended a uh, an annual meeting. I looked at the annual report, and uh, I had the effrontery to get up and tell the Commodore Sperry Berg, who was a very strict gentleman, that uh, the club was insolvent. And uh, there was a bit of a furore, and then somebody said, "Well." you're an accountant, you fix it, and I was elected treasurer of the CYC. I was about 23 at the time, so I was a very young treasurer of the CYC. Uh, very active, uh, let's say socially. <clears throat> we had a 22-foot boat. We were very much involved with the uh, running of the, the House Committee, as it was known in those days. And uh, our the first thing in our mind <clears throat> was to convert the old, uh, the old building, the old uh, uh, boat shed that was here into a clubhouse. At the time it was just a series of rooms upstairs, a couple of bedrooms, a bathroom, kitchen, uh, and a lovely awning that looked out over the bay. Uh, I got a team of fellas together that followed me as treasurer. Well, I had a little bit of say being on the committee. Fellows like David Jones, Bill Solomons, I'm trying to think of names, Nick Alexander, Alan Campbell. And uh, one day we uh, came down to the club one uh, Saturday evening and ripped the interior of the club out and made a great big room where there were- On purpose? Uh, on purpose, <laughs> yes, oh, yes, 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 we did it on purpose. <laughs> We had no plans. We had no idea about the ceiling falling in. Well, I think we propped a couple of things up. And uh, there we were, we had a clubhouse. Well, the Commodore turned up the next day and he was not very happy. He threatened to expel us all. And But from that uh, started the uh, rebuilding of the clubhouse. So that's an early memory. And what, what boats were you sailing on then, Bill? You obviously mentioned the smaller boat, but then you graduated on to, to bigger yes, uh, I, uh, I had, uh, we had an narrator. We sailed with the amateurs at the time. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, I went over there and uh, Cliff Gale, we, we went over to see, we, we couldn't join a yacht club in those days. We were 22 year old boys. Uh, the squadron, Alfred Edwards, wouldn't have us. Uh, and somebody said, go to the amateurs, they'll, they'll have you. And we, we saw Cliff, he said, uh, he was on his boat, we sailed up to him. He said, why do you want to join the amateurs? We said, we want to go sailing, <laughs> we want to race. He said, turn up next Wednesday at our meeting. And so we, we joined the amateurs. That was my first club. Uh, 
back here as treasurer, I had a lot to do with Peter Green. He was on the committee, and he was highly respected. And uh, around 56, he said to me, uh, uh, would you want to come to Hobart? I jumped at the chance and so did my first Hobart race on Gypsy Queen with, uh, with uh, Peter. Well, that whetted my appetite uh, for ocean racing. It was a good race. Uh, we actually uh, uh, broke our steering and uh, still continued and finished and hit the mark at the finish. There was a bit of a controversy at the time we were disqualified and subsequently appealed uh, to YA and the appeal was upheld because our bowers had crossed first and uh, and so I think we got a third in the he race for the well, breaker. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, he was a good man to sell with Peter. Uh, Peter then uh, from that uh, Margaret I've known as my girlfriend and wife for well over 60 years and uh, she wasn't happy about sailing on uh, the 22-footer. We capsized it at one stage uh, up near Lady Jane Beach and uh, she wasn't too happy and it was a case of either staying with Margaret and not sailing or getting a bigger boat. So I got a bigger boat. <laughs> and Cyrene was my first. She was uh, a Derwent-class boat about 30 six foot, no rails of course in those days and we did all the early CYC races, Bird Island, Tom Thumb, uh, didn't do Montague in her and then uh, after Cyrene I bought Waree, that, that was an interesting story, uh, on Cyrene we're racing to Pitwater Saturday morning, big southerly blowing Solo had only recently been launched and uh, we're sailing up in a, I think it was a squadron day because uh, it was the Commodore at the time, uh, Wazzo Dixon was Commodore at the time and he was sailing Waree. Uh, sorry, he wasn't sailing Waree, he was sailing his new boat which was Dorsky I think. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, we're going out the heads, big southerly blowing, and Norski loses her mast. Uh, we were close behind sailing, no motor, and uh, two men went overboard. Uh, I caught up to them in the water, rounded up, and put my bows in between them and smashed it in between them. I could have killed them, I suppose, but we picked one up from either side. And uh, Wazza was very pleased about this. He took us back to the squadron, wined and dined us, and then showed me his magnificent yacht war yacht slips and said, she's for sale, why don't you buy her? <laughs> and so I bought war -y. And you had great success with her? We had a lot of success with her. We sailed uh, with First Division of the Squadron and we sailed with the CYC in uh, overnight races to Bird Island, Tom Thumb. Uh, no rails, down below, uh, nothing down below, no galley, no toilet. Uh, water used to, we'd go through a wave uh, that had come over the bows and it would disappear into the hull of the boat before it got to the stern. <laughs> we had a person pumping all the time. Uh, one of our first early crew members was Malcolm Barlow, you, you may remember from Barlow Winters, and uh, uh, that was his job, he'd be down below pumping for hours. So that was Waree. Uh, around that time I was about to get married and I I was flag officer of the club and uh, heading for Commodore and the tradition of the club at the time was that the Commodore sailed his own boat to Hobart so uh, uh, I sold Wurri I think for a hundred pounds and I'm, I think I only got fifty pounds of it <laughs> and uh, 
uh, bought Les Les. That's a story in itself. Uh, Margaret, uh, who was my wife then, uh, and I went up to Pitwater to Chick's uh, boat shed, if you remember, Chick up at Pit, Pit, Pitwater, Palm Beach Marine Service, it was called then, and uh, rowed out to the boat. And uh, from the moment I stepped on board, I thought, oh boy, this is my boat. Uh, she was uh, beautiful down below to me, uh, looked very comfortable uh, and uh, had a, reason, a good record in ocean racing. So uh, bought the lass. Uh, Alan Campbell came on board and he helped me enormously in getting a crew together and we raced the lass many years with uh, a certain amount of success I think. We probably won one of each of the races up and down the coast except the Hobart race. If I can, I can take you back to, uh, or take you forward to the early 60s and you'd filled a number of roles here at the club with flag officer roles, but I think in 1963 you along with Norman Ridge and Trig Halverson sparked the flame for Australia's participation in the Admiral's Cup series. How did that come about? Well, we, we were doing, we did a Hobart race, conclusion of the race. Uh, we, in fact, for a couple of years, we had had probably the first quiet little drink. <laughs> and Trigg, uh, who I respected enormously, Norman, who was a little younger than me, and I used to meet and talk about our experiences at one of the pubs. I've forgotten the names now, but it was one of the pubs on the waterfront and uh, uh, after this race which Trigg had won um, we're talking and saying well you know we think we're pretty good over here, here but how good are we? Let's try the Admiral's Cup. I said and Trigg said well I'll do it. Norman said well, I'll do it. Let's get together and form a group to go over there and compete. Uh, Norman, a very wise Norman Ridge, said, look, we've got to get a top man on board to run this thing. Uh, let's uh, go to, uh, uh, oh, what was his name? Uh, Kirby. Uh, Sir James Kirby. Sir James, mm -hmm. Sir James Kirby. My mind no, is no, 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 be. No let's go to Sir James. Uh, uh, we get back to Sydney. Uh, we, we're talking here in the club, in the old club, and he says, let's do a letter. And he did a letter to him proposing that uh, he supports us in getting a team to go to the Admiral's Cup. Uh, Sir James was on the board of Qantas, which we thought would give us some advantage. And he said, we won't post this, we'll go up to his place and put it in his letterbox. And so the three of us get in the car and go over to Vaucluse, put it in Sir James' letterbox. He came back very quickly, very interested, and uh, without him it wouldn't have happened. Uh, he got his man in uh, London, very fine old English gentleman, to uh, uh, get things organised for us. Back here we set up a series of rules to select a team for the Admiral's Cup. We had a series of races on the harbour and offshore, including the Hobart race. And uh, the man in London got us accommodation, excellent accommodation. Well, it wasn't excellent, it was pretty rough accommodation, but it was good for the team. There were, there were at least uh, 20 of us. Margaret and I went over. I went over as Commodore, wasn't on any of the boats. And uh, that was the beginning of the uh, first challenge, which we came uh, second in the yeah. first challenge. Yes, yes. Now you uh, um, were Commodore twice in two different periods over in this club. Tell us about some of the characters, in the, especially in the early days. I mean, we all know the Mickleboroughs and the Sidey Hammonds, yeah. but there must, you must have seen a, a lot of characters come through the club. Yeah, well, you, I, can not, uh, you can name them all. <laughs> I'd start with Jack Halliday, Captain Jack, yeah. and his son Sauce. Yeah. 
they, uh, they were fierce competitors and good friends. We were all good friends that raced together in those days. It might still be so, but we'd, we'd always come back to the club and spend the evening or the day drinking and talking about the race. So Jack Halliday, Carol J would be one of the first. Jan uh, uh, Soon, Russell right. Slade, Jan Soon. He was a very uh, fine man, very good businessman and a very good sailor. And through Jan Soon we met Richard Hammond, of course, uh, Colin Betts and, and uh, that particular team. Uh, then we've got... Uh, Oh, I'm trying to think of the boats. Uh, Gordon Ingate, of course, mm. uh, still the same, the same then as he is yeah, now. Yeah. Of course, the Halversons, they were very much the part Halversons, of the scene. Yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. the Halversons were highly respected. In mm. fact, you know, respected to the point where we wouldn't speak to them unless they spoke to us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then um, in the early 70s, you commissioned the lovely Spark and the Stevens design Beltami. That's right. Yeah, and you had great success with her. Yeah, yeah we did. Uh, I went to Ireland Stevens, uh, went to New York actually and saw him and told him what I wanted. He said uh, he'd go ahead with it. He did plans. I returned when the plans were done and we, we changed a few little things because uh, uh, I suggested uh, certain things. And uh, we came up with uh, Meltemi, which was the forerunner of the Swan 42, the beginning of the Swans, anyhow. Mm. And uh, uh, Swan 44, uh, Meltemi was a 44. And we were quite successful with her, never, could never win a Hobart race, but we won a few other races. Uh, took her to uh, the Med, won the Aegean Rally. Uh, then went on to, uh, because there was a war in Greece and uh, ha having been uh, born in Greece, came to Australia as a, as a baby, my parents actually went to uh, Greece for their honeymoon. They were, they were married in Australia and uh, they went back to the island where they were born. And uh, so uh, I have a, an interest in sailing in Greece mm. because of that I speak Greek and I love sailing there. I used to love sailing there. <laughs> and uh, there was a war with Turkey and I, I was uh, concerned that I, I could have been taken up into the army, the Greek army fighting Turks, which <laughs> doesn't didn't really interest me. Be interesting for the Commodore of the CYC to do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there was Commodore. Yes. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, uh, I, I had to go on to London, but uh, the boat was sailed to, uh, to uh, we were down at Ethra and some Frenchman on a boat said, uh, Costas Merelda is the place, the Aga Khan has just established a club there, they have good racing there. So we decided that she'd go there and uh, again a name that escapes me. Uh, Another Roger, Roger Grimes, uh, oh, nice. uh, took the boat over with a number of other crew, four or five crew. All they had was road maps, they had no charts of the area, but they knew they had to sail around the bottom of Greece, then went around the bottom of Greece, head, uh, let us say, in a westerly direction, and eventually you'd come to Italy, and so they did. And as it turned out, uh, the minute they appeared off Costas Merelda, I turned up from uh, London, I'd been in London on business, picked the boat up uh, and uh, we're of course uh, having a few drinks and I'm saying, well, I, I expect the Aga Khan will have me up at his house soon, uh, let me know if he contacts you. A few hours later, uh, Roger finds me and says, the Aga Khan has asked you to his home tonight. <laughs> I thought he was joking. Uh, Margaret was very impressed, of course, and uh, we didn't have many reasonable clothes having been traveling. So we were trying to doll up. We went off to uh, an English pub that had started 
in Costa Smeralda and uh, uh, primed ourselves for the event, then turned up at the uh, at the Aga Khan's home with uh, tie and yachting jacket, of course. And uh, the Aga Khan opens the door, looks at me and says, Ah, oh, Mr. Saltus, welcome. He said, take your tie and coat off. So that's how the, how the meeting started. Went inside and probably most of the uh, yachting architects of the world were there. Olin Stevens, I can remember well. Dick Carter is another name that comes to mind. There were at least a dozen uh, naval architects there. He was just starting uh, his sailing series there. And uh, a number of other noted, uh, Huey Long may have been there, I can't remember. But uh, it was a lovely night. I, had, I was having trouble with my engine, I told him, in passing, he said, oh, I'll send my engineer along to have a look at it. Uh, next morning, he turns up with his engineer and they tinker around and fix my engine up. Uh, so that's how our uh, relationship started. You mentioned Huey Long before, an American yachtsman who had the range of on beans that came out here. Am I right in saying you sailed the Hobart on on beans? I did. You did, yes. that's right. And you won... Line on We've got line on us, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been an experience and a half to sail on a it was, big American Maxi. It was. Yeah. Uh, the Ondine I sailed on, uh, Ondine, during this first trip when I went to Rothschild, the next day he said, will you go through America? And I had to go uh, to New York and see Huey Long, who I had met through the Hobart race. And he, of course, jumped at the opportunity of coming over. And then I went to Los Angeles and saw uh, Jim Kilroy and got uh, him on board mm. to, uh, to sail in that series. Uh, where were we? Talk about, about Ondine and sailing. Oh, Ondine, Ondine, yes. Ondine, yeah. uh, Ondine was, was a, a big, yeah, the first Ondines were beautiful boats, but, but this Ondine was a big cumbersome machine and it was, uh, looked more like a, a submarine than, than a yacht. And uh, uh, I remember uh, I was a guest on board, and, and every time I tried to do something, Huey would say, Oh, just sit down and somebody will handle it for you. Now, we're going down the coast, big nor'easter blowing, uh, we passed the Hippolytes, he had a kite up, and uh, we're going pretty fast, and I. Uh, had the temerity to say to him, I think you should take your kite off, get a headsail up, we're about to round up, and it gets pretty strong in under Tasman Light, in Storm Bay. He said, oh, don't, uh, don't worry about it, we've got people here that can handle it. Well, they have their kite up, we get down to Tasman Light, and bingo, over we go on our side, lose the kite, how we didn't lose anybody with it because it's flapping around and uh, eventually she got up and uh, they got a head salon and we sailed into Hobart very quickly. That's my experience of uh, on the... <laughs> and Bill, in the early 70s I think it's fair to say that you were rather uh, outspoken uh, about the age allowance that was involved in, in ocean racing at that time. I think it was tried to get a balance to try and keep the older boats into the sport. Now you, I think you'd had a new boat with Mel Turney and mm. then I think some of the older boats were staying to win the Hobart race and do well in the Hobart race. But you you were quite, as I said, outspoken about that and, and you didn't think that was quite the way to go with the age allowance? Yes, that's true. Uh, when it came in, I didn't think it was the way to go. I've changed my mind now. Yes. I'm older and wiser. I and uh, Gordon Ingate in particular spoke vehemently against it, but uh, in retrospect it is the way to go, mm. yeah. and uh, yeah. I've accepted it. Mm. Now I, I, I know I, I really fast forward now to 1998, the very tragic Sydney Hobart race when we had all those loss of life and that horrendous storm swept across the fleet as they approached Bass Strait. But, I guess in one way it was a sad occasion, but for you it must have given you a great joy because your son Ed 
won that race on correct time in his little boat. I mean, that must have been a, yeah, well, a the, thrill in a sense. The greatest joy we got out of the finish of the race was that Ed and Arthur were home safe. We were terribly, well, I was terribly worried. Margaret was obviously worried. Mm. I was consoling her, but not not really uh, believing in what I was saying. Uh, I thought they were going, they were in a lot of trouble. I picked up the little uh, little boat they were on. Uh, uh, Edward had just bought it. I picked her up up the Parramatta River and brought her back to the CYC uh, with uh, Alan Campbell, I think. And uh, we're on the boat and, and, and both of us said we wouldn't go to Pitwater in this boat. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm thinking this while I'm, I'm mm. hearing the stories of uh, giant waves and I know what the giant waves are like. I've rolled a boat in the Straits. Uh, we rolled the Lass in the Straits and uh, so we were very, very sad about the people dying and, and wondering whether we'd ever see our two sons again. Not only two sons, we had two sons, a very, very good friend of his, a brother-in-law. Uh, they were all good friends on the boat. Anyhow, so it was great to hear that they uh, finished, they were home safe, and then that they won. Well, it was a bit of an afterthought mm, yeah. <laughs> at the time. Yeah, a bit of sweet victory, I guess, in the yeah. circumstances, yes. And uh, so your sons are still very much involved in sailing, and you, even now, are Sailing still with your old friend George Curtis. Yeah, still yeah. sail with George. We Fantastic. started sailing together. He actually introduced me to sailing. I sail on Marlu, and uh, but I still know what I'm doing. I, I'm slow, but I get ready before I need to get ready, and I do what I've got to do, uh, and that's let off the the head saw <laughs> to lure it, and uh, I do that very well. Now and again, uh, I take the helm for George if he wants a break, if we're doing a longish race. And uh, generally, I'm enjoying my sailing. It's something to do. Well, you've seen the sport since the 50s, and now we're here in 2014. What do you see the state of ocean racing at the moment? I mean, the, the boats are ridiculously different to 1950s. Mm. What, what, what do you, what's your feeling of the sport? Well, I've certainly seen uh, the evolution of ocean racing, uh, yes, Boats had started racing prior to when I uh, started sailing, but there weren't the number of boats that are sailing now. And certainly regulations have changed, lifelines, radio, communication, uh, safety. Safety is an enormous thing. In, case, in fact, I'm, although uh, I shouldn't say it, it's not good politics to say it, I think that we're overdoing the safety thing we used to go with nothing and, and uh, we were able to look after ourselves. Now uh, crew expect, uh, expect uh, to be mothered on the way to Hobart. But uh, it certainly has changed. The boats are efficient. I look at Edward's boat, the present Midnight Rambler, and uh, although she's light, she's strong, she's well engineered and I'm quite sure she's quite safe. I keep telling myself when there's a blow and he's in it, uh, he's about to do the uh, Auckland-Fiji race, so that'll be another test. Mm. But uh, certainly there's no comparison between the way we used to race 50 years ago in the Carol Jays, the Janzunes, the Lassalas, Ingates boats, uh, and now the modern boats. Uh, they are efficient uh, engineering machines. I'm dead against uh, motors running as I was against the uh, age allowance. <laughs> I'm dead against uh, motors running and pressing buttons to uh, haul sails up or haul sails in. And they should be able to do it if they want to in a separate division and not win our major races, I believe. If I was young enough, I'd campaign to get that rule in, but uh, now I just sit back quietly and watch it all. Okay. Well, you've made an amazing contribution to the Cruising Yacht Club through your uh, efforts on committees and as Commodore in two separate um, 
times here, and I think a lot of people said it was long overdue that you got your life membership in 1999. That, that again, must have given you a great thrill and it was. a wonderful reward for the effort you put into this club. It was a great thrill. I, uh, uh, I knew all the past uh, life members, and it was a, a great reward. Uh, and uh, one thing, as I come down here, as I came up out of the car today, I see the clubhouse and uh, I believe I've contributed something to that, as have all the members. One of the things I tried to do was to get all members of the club getting involved in making the club what it is. Uh, and then uh, sitting in this boardroom, I remember some of our meetings in the old shed. I remember overdrafts, I remember going to the bank and uh, asking them for overdrafts which we had to support uh, by members uh, guaranteeing the, the debt and uh, I look at the present balance sheet with millions in the bank and uh, a wonderful source of income in the uh, marina out there. Well Bill, thank you for your time, it's been great. Um, as I said earlier, your contribution has been enormous to making this club what it is and I think the membership are indebted to your efforts through a huge amount of time and the effort that you've put in. So enjoy your Wednesday sale and go well. Thank you, Peter.